here by an illustrious group of people who are all involved in um, an important policy and legal decisions within um, major companies in free and open source software. I'm going to let each of you very, very briefly um, introduce yourselves and your roles at your company. My name is Carol Smith. I'm at, in the Open Source Programs Office at Microsoft. I am previously uh, worked at GitHub and Google, but uh, I run uh, quite a few programs internally at Microsoft now as part of the OSPO uh, for advocating for FOSS internally. Uh, my name is Max Sills. I work in the Open Source Programs Office at Google. Uh, I'm an attorney there, and we do uh, inbound and outbound compliance, but we also do open source adoption and kind of selling it internally. My name is Jelaine Lovejoy. I'm the um, Open Source Counsel at ARM, and so I deal with pretty much the variety of legal issues and some probably not so legal that come up at ARM and um, help form the ARM Open Source Office. I'm Richard Fontana. I'm an in-house lawyer at Red Hat. Um, my work mostly focuses on um, open source licensing issues and, and, and particularly supporting um, software developers, engineers at Red Hat. Now, as someone who's always looking at this from the role of the community, it's a bit uh, opaque to us how, how, what the mechanisms are within major companies in terms of bringing the message of free and open source software. And we know that many of the faces that we see, like all of you, at our conferences are some of the biggest proponents for free and open source software in industry. I'm wondering, could each of you say an example of a major win that you had in bringing free and open source software to your company? And I guess we'll just, because of the microphone situation, we'll just go back and please keep your answers brief because we so don't have a lot of time. Uh, yeah, so most recently at Microsoft, we've been building out an internal advocates program that is uh, focused around identifying people at different levels, in different regions, in different departments who are all, uh, in one way or another, interested in free and open source software and bringing them together to be in contact with each other and then also empowering them to be able to be advocates within their department, within their region, whatever the case may be, and to be able to, uh, to talk about uh, to be kind of our mouthpiece, the OSPO, OSPO's mouthpiece to, to their teams, to their uh, regions, and to be able to uh, feel like they can answer questions and advocate uh, themselves, and so that we are not only providing policy ourselves and answering questions, but we're also able to, uh, to empower other people to do it as well, so it's more of a community effort internally. I think the, the best thing we do on that front is Google Summer Code. Um, I think there's a temptation in, there's a, in a corporation to just consume, 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 especially with, with the profit motive. And I think we do a particularly good job of giving back to the community and actually nurturing pro, uh, projects. And I think we've done a good job kind of telling that story to our executives and showing that you get the most value if you give back. So at ARM, we recently rolled out a new um, sort of workflow process for request and approval for contributing or creating open source projects. Um, we had a process previously, but kind of did an overhaul and got it into a database-driven um, system, which now we can kind of have better sort of reporting at what we're doing. So I think that was a pretty big win. Um, I mean, the, the goal of that was to make it sort of e easier for everyone involved in that process, but in particular, make it easier for engineers. And um, the, the other sort of thing I would like to mention that um, is sort of related to that is something I saw recently that really made me smile in terms of like the sort of win factor was sort of watching one of our engineers present about sort of some processes that he'd put in place for contributions to a project that he works have, but we contribute to heavily. And he presented this at sort of an internal open source um, event and other engineers heard this and they started to emulate that without anyone sort of setting a policy or a mandate for that. And I just thought, you know, if engineers can encourage other engineers without basically me or someone else from legal nagging them and to good, do good practices, that's just like, law. <laughs> you know, yay to the awesome engineers at ARM for that kind of, seeing those kinds of things. So I don't have a story about a, a big win. Uh, so, so Red Hat has been involved in, in open source development from, from its founding and before open source was actually um, a, a, a coined term. So back when people were talking about free software solely. Um, I, I think, so I don't have a, a big win story. Um, a lot of my work 
Um, so there's, we have an office at, at Red Hat, a department called Open Source and Standards, which is separate from the legal department, and they do some of the work that, that open source offices at other companies do in terms of like promoting uh, strategic projects and, and, and um, community management and community marketing. They might have a different answer to this, but for me, it's like a lot of little things that I've done over the years have been focused on um, first removing barriers to um, people outside of Red Hat getting involved in, in projects that Red Hat gets started, and second, removing um, obstacles to Red Hat engineers themselves um, starting new projects w without uh, a whole lot of you know, bureaucracy and so forth. So we heard about wins, which makes, begs the question, when did things go terribly wrong? When were you trying to advocate for free and open source software within your company and it just all went disastrously? That you can tell us. So I don't have a story about a big, like, like fail. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but so, so again, like the, 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 the thing that I've worried about, it, so Red Hat is kind of a first mover in open source. I, I've, I've worried, and I, I think a lot of people at the company are concerned about this as well, as Red Hat gets bigger and bigger, um, we move further and further from those, from those roots, and we get a lot of people coming from other companies, different kinds of corporate cultures, not, not as experienced in open source. So how do we, um, how do we in the legal department, um, make sure that we continue to have this environment where, where um, developers are very free to, to, um, you know, to, to start new projects and, and um, you know, to, to not have, um, to, to not do what, what legal departments sort of naturally do, which is sort of like, like to clamp down and impose a lot of rules and, and, and regulations on things. So that's something that I, you know, increasingly um, am concerned about and, and it motivates a lot of my current work. Um, so I mentioned uh, on the win about this new process that we rolled out recently. So I think the, my, my sort of example of things going terribly wrong was the previous process, um, which um, had improved slowly over years, but still as someone, uh, when I was prepping for this, suggested you could put it as um, sometimes it took longer or took less time to write the patch than to get it approved. And, um, and I would say as a lawyer, because I can say this, even though it's recorded, I might get in trouble. If you're a lawyer, your engineers are your clients too, and don't ignore them, because I think sometimes in companies, um, the emphasis is on the bottom line and closing deals, and engineers' needs get a little bit uh, backburnered. Not okay, in my opinion. Um, I don't think the salespeople can sell the products that pay your salaries if you don't have the engineers um, making them. So. If that's the argument you need to make to your legal department, <laughs> then feel free to use that one. Um, so yeah, so you know, trying to get that uh, on board and and making engineers' lives easier, which I think is sort of a, a theme Richard was talking about as well. So I'm not going to call it a failure. I'll just say it's a growth opportunity. Uh, <laughs> a growth opportunity. <laughs> yeah, a growth opportunity. Yeah, it's marketing. Um, <laughs> So we've been really interested lately in giving more and more projects to open source foundations. And I think we're experiencing some growing pains. The over how much control to give up. So everyone wants to emulate the success of an, the organic success of an open source project that just kind of grows from bottom up. But the, I guess the legal temptation, the, the business temptation is to exercise complete control over projects. And it's just kind of an ongoing dialogue about how it's kind of counterintuitive, but in order for a project to be successful, you kind of need to give up control. And that means giving up intellectual property control, giving up management control, and actually letting communities participate in, determine the direction of a project. And that can be really scary for, for a big company. So, But, you know, it's an, it's an ongoing process. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Fail. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's right. I, I think there was a, a couple of recent projects. Where, well, you know exactly what the fail is. I just want to know what the fail was. Okay. The fail is we, we weren't able to give a project away in a way that we wanted to, and so the project was not able to grow. And so we, need to, we, we talked about that, and we're trying to be a little bit looser. Um, I don't have a specific fails, 
per se, but um, I will say that um, we experience a lot of different people who are on many sides of the spectrum, from all the way from it should only ever be proprietary, I don't understand what you hippies are talking about, all the way to, of course, it should be FOSS, it's always FOSS, um, why isn't it easier for it to always be FOSS? Um, and I think uh, the, the growth opportunities there for us are on uh, moving people who are farther on this side of the spectrum, farther to this side of the spectrum, and, and not doing that in a way that is um, like we're trying to sell or market to, to people internally, but that we are available and we will answer your questions and we will help facilitate and we will reduce friction for you in any way that we can. And we're happy to have the conversations that you want. Uh, but at the end of the day, sometimes they want to stay on that side of the spectrum. And, and that's un unfortunately or, or fortunately for them, I guess, uh, that's just the way that it's going to go. So you all work at pretty big companies, and uh, and you're all uh, responsible for areas that cross uh, that work across different areas. And I'm wondering, how does this all work out across different departments in your companies, and also different geographic areas? You know, are you able to standardize things ac ac across different cultures, and how does that work out for free and open source software? Um, I actually think that the answer is probably no. We can't we can't standardize in that, and that that's kind of a purposeful decision. Um, we want to create the community internally that is across regions, across departments, across teams. Um, and by the way, going back to my previous answer to the question, and some of some teams of whom will never participate in this, and we we accept that as a as a fact. But that the people who are enthusiastic. Uh, advocates and, and adopters. Uh, we want to empower them to be able to do the things that make sense for them and specifically for their situations uh, with obviously within the, the bounds of our, our overall policy, but um, that they, they, we should empower them to, to do what makes sense for them in their particular situations. And, uh, and that, yes, it, it does vary quite a bit by culture and that's, that's actually a, a good thing. And so um, that's why we want this program to exist because we in the OSPO can never be able to can never uh, answer all, all questions for all cultures and we, we, we shouldn't we should provide the, the boundaries and the, and the guidelines and then you can uh, work within those those guidelines however makes sense for you so our, our company has gotten really big and it used to <laughs> when I started a couple of years ago um, when I was really new to everything I think I had like a very legalistic punitive mindset I had like a set of policies that had to be followed and everyone in the company had to listen to me. Um, I, I grew out of that really quick, but it also and it, wore, it failed terribly and it didn't scale. So at this point we don't, and you, it sounds like you had a similar situation. What, the only thing that scales at a big company is just trying to be available to solve problems for engineers. And so we've, we've really shifted from, from trying to tell people what to do to just offering ourselves a center, as a center of expertise. Because people are really hungry for knowledge on open source. They really do want to contribute very quickly. And I think the, the best thing we can do is just try to figure out how to get out of their way. And that, that's the only thing that really scales. So it's interesting. A lot of, I see, hear a lot of the same themes, or I would you know, echo some of those. But it's like a little different angle. I mean, we're a lot smaller. Um, that may, may be part of the difference, but we've got pretty consistent sort of processes across the company, which I think is important because you should be considering the same types of things. And, and um, so that's been good and kind of, um, I think there was a bit more silos previously and sort of it takes a little bit of like, you know, from the outside, it's all one company. So I mean, if you, you know, you, you want to have some freedom to do different things, but you also have to remember that uh, from the outside, you know, no one looking at it the same way, you know, that you are within the company. Um, and I think, like, something I've noticed recently, just to echo the sort of um, providing the info and guidelines, um, just in terms of, like, putting open source code out there, we've been sort of trying to create more guidance on sort of how to do that and how to do it in a sort of consistent way, not to be, like, mandating certain things, but just to provide some consistency. And I find engineers are asking for that. You know, they, they don't. Like, well, I, I want to do this right, or I want to put the license in the right place, so, you know, how do I do that? So it's like, well, if you just have that info there, then it makes it easy, and it makes everybody's life easier than having to ask the same question over and over, so forth and so on. 
So we, we have uh, Red Hat um, engineers are involved in open source development like across all the different divisions of engineering and actually in, in other technical um, oriented departments that are not part of engineering. So, so it's across the whole company, across um, different geographic um, you know, divisions. Um, I think that we, uh, to me, I, it always made sense to have uniform kinds of policies and standards. It never, I never really thought that it was a good idea to have different standards for different groups. There, sometimes this happens uh, that, that we, we would do acquisitions and um, the acquisition would be a company that was already doing open source development in a certain way that was different from how Red Hat was previously doing open source development. And some of those um, different practices um, stuck on and I don't know if that was always positive. So I think that, that we've tried to promote a, a kind of um, company-wide standard approach. We do have differences in culture across different engineering teams and I've tried to nourish and uh, nurture, nurture that, um, not nourish. Um, uh, uh, I mean, sometimes this comes up in, in, in issues of um, the kinds of tools projects want to use. It, very often, so a legally relevant issue is, is license, um, the preferences of, of licenses used by different projects. We don't have a, a single preferred license. Um, and and at, at one time, there was sort of an expectation at Red Hat, because it came out of a, a Linux-oriented culture, that, that um, you know, most projects would use GPL version 2. Um, and, and it was actually a pretty, pretty important thing to, to establish that this was not um, necessary for, for all teams. Some teams actually, for, for because of the culture of the communities they were working in, preferred um, more permissive licensing. And um, for Red Hat, that was kind of a big, big kind of change. And, uh, and I've tried to encourage that and, and have um, a diversity of, of that sort of philosophical or policy choice across different engineering teams and, and very much empowering different engineering teams to make those sorts of what I think of as more, more discretionary choices. This is, this is a gimme for Richard, but uh, I was wondering, in each of your companies, um, have you been able to, or are, are there parts of the new employee onboarding process that encourage the use of free and open source software? And if so, have you, have you, have you been a part, have you been able to influence that? And, um, and, and just talk very, very briefly about that. So the use of software, sort of internal use of, of oh, I mean, so that's actually a big, in, in, I mean, so, so Red Hat's products are sort of by, by kind of company de facto policy, sort of open source license themselves. There has been a big um, kind of debate going on for actually, you know, more than a dec decade at Red Hat over this issue of whether it's good or bad to use proprietary tools internally. And we have some, you know, part of the, the issue is that we have some, some teams that feel very strongly that they should just use um, free software tools. But this is, very often the kind of the, the, the older sort of established groups at the company, like the, the, those who work on Fedora and so forth. And then you have um, kind of newer teams, in a sense, newer in terms of the company's history, that tend to actually prefer, you know, y using um, um, non-open source tools to get their work done, which is very often, if they're engineers, um, engaging in open source development. So. Um, it isn't really something that, that I get involved in. Uh, on the legal side, it's um, something that I've sort of learned to accept as another aspect of diversity, that that should be kind of tolerated. I have my own preferences. I like to pref I, I prefer, um, generally prefer um, free software tools, but, but I kind of, you know, I, I have many colleagues who don't. So, yeah, I, I, I mean, for the in, sort of internal use tooling, I haven't been as involved in that. We, we did some time ago try to make that easier as well to get sort of be able to use things that are un, under an open source license because, you know, risk is lower from the legal side. But I think, you know, you'd have to ask an engineer of what they think, and I know there's some pretty strong opinions on, on that, which I can't speak to. Um, I mean, in terms of using open source in our products, you know, we were a member of Open Chain and, and, and actively involved in SPDX, so we've got, you know, various processes around that to, to make that easier and those sort of approval systems easier and more streamlined to make it, you know, easier to do the right thing and, and, and use open source as appropriate in the given product. So, you know, sort of. So we use open source in every single product. And every engineer that we hire touches open source. Like literally 30, 40 percent of any binary that we ship is just open source code. So part of the thing that my group does is we educate all new employees on open source and on how to do compliance right. 
within the first two weeks of their employment. And we have like one hour with them, so we try to, that's our one focused hour, maybe in their entire career at Google where we can talk to them about compliance. And we're really focused on respect over legalism. I think a lot of, it, I don't know, a lot of engineers just want to grab anything they can to make their lives easier. But what we try to teach them is that they are the open source community. We've recruited them from the open source community. And that we know they're going to use open source and we're going to ship a ton of it, but they must do so respectfully. And when they reproduce a license notice, for example, it's not just a matter of complying with the terms of the license. It's a matter of respecting the community of people that helped us make money, that helped us ship this product. Uh, so going back to the whole I uh, work for a big company thing, uh, you had you had specifically asked about new hire training and um, the evolution of our new hire training has gone all the way from we try to tell you everything you could ever possibly need to know in the entire time you're going to be here for 20 years all the way to uh, we d we're not going to tell you anything, just figure it out yourself and then back again and then back again and then back again. So um, this is an evolution because everyone in the company wants to tell you uh, specific things you need to know when you when you start uh, at, at a company because that's might be the only time we're ever actually able to to get in touch with you. Um, so the answer to your question is uh, no, we don't have it currently in the new hire training, but it's kind of a function of the fact that um, it's it's kind of everyone has to be a new hire, everyone has to have topics in new hire training, or no one ha gets to have topics in new hire training. Um, but with that said, I think. Uh, the in engineers who are specifically interested in using FOSS and participating in FOSS uh, seek us out and find us, and we have other internal methods like this uh, advocates program of, of, getting, of finding those people and, and making them aware of the policy at that point. So we have one minute left. So <laughs> in the briefest way you can possibly say, in one sentence or less, what would you tell someone who was starting a new open source programs office? <laughs> That's really difficult. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Make sure you have a variety of perspectives in the group, whether it's like different roles across the different parts of the business. So I would say there isn't one single way to have an open source office or to handle open source uh, at a company. Um, we have a kind of division approach. We don't have an open source office per se. Sorry, that was one, one sentence. So. <laughs> My one sentence would be, keep open source code away from company code. Segregated. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> um, uh, oh, God, this is really hard. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think variety of perspectives. Actually, I'm sorry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to like, have a variety of perspectives because it could be the case that you don't even need an OSPO, or it could be the case that you do. Like, there's so many, so many p possible ways you can do this. Have a variety of perspectives. Yeah. Let's give our panelists a big hand. Thank you.